Broadcasting from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia to around the globe. You're listening to Shark Bite Biz, your exclusive place for business strategy, sales, marketing, and tech in the roaring 20s. And now, here's your host, David Strausser. Welcome to another edition of Shark Bite Biz, and I'm your glorious host, David Strausser, and I want to thank you. Yes, you, for tuning in and helping Sharp Bite Biz have such a successful first month launch. Today's episode is the last episode in the very first month of Shark Bite Biz, and we have received so much amazing feedback and support as we grow this community. It is obvious to me and all of us that people are looking for answers on how to pivot their business during these times of craziness. I decided to take a special step for this huge one month episode by bringing in something great, some real American innovation. Here at Shark Bite Biz, and even with my main job at Vision 33, we are huge supporters of small business and innovation. We assist in innovation, and that's why when I see something I like and love, I want the creators to jump on our show and tell us all about it. If you own a business, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It started with a dream, then a plan, then testing the waters, then gathering some support, and actually building it. That's what today's interview is about, bringing a new, useful, innovative platform to life using the promise of technology. Something this platform has in common with our listeners is that I think most business entrepreneurs are creatives and dreamers. They love to create things, whether new lines of clothing, tech, you know, all the good stuff. You are designing a business Just like I have, I think most people have dabbled in putting out a book at some point also. Entrepreneurs are always creating something. Alessandra Torre and JD Lasica are both founders of Authors AI, a tech startup that is using artificial intelligence to help authors improve their novels. Their technology, called Marlowe, is able to read a novel and deliver an impressive critique of the story's plot, characters, pacing, and more. So without further delay, let's bring in Alessandra and JD to talk about Authors AI. Creative and Innovation Tips everybody, let's give a big welcome to J.D. Lassica and Alessandra Torre for joining Shark Bite Biz. Thank you so much for joining the discussion today. It's awesome to be here. Thank you for having us. Oh, Great to be here. I guess this is your first uh, two for, right? Uh, two entrepreneurs for the price of one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I get a break here. <laughs> so let, let's kick it off. Really easy softball first question, okay? Why don't you both give us a little bit of background? How are you, you know, your experience, how you came together for the project, and exactly what is Authors AI? I'll start. I'm Alessandra. Um, I am started in writing romance novels. That's how I got into this industry. Authors AI is a business that's focused on books, on writing, and uh, creating and marketing great books. So I started publishing in 2012, and now um, I've written 26 novels, uh, mostly romance and suspense. But um, I moved out of writing and really into other areas of the author business a few years ago, and was lucky enough to come across the team at Authors AI. And uh, that's where where I came from and where I am now. Wow, 26 books, that, no little feat. That's quite an accomplishment. A lot of, uh, that's a lot of books. I can't even write one yet. So <laughs> congrats with that. What about you, JD? Yeah, we'll, we'll get you going there, David, on your <laughs> author track. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, my background is in journalism, actually, and uh, entrepreneurship. I've launched a couple of other different startups here in greater Silicon Valley. I got hooked into the fiction writing world a few years ago, so now I'm also a uh, thriller author. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of your your listeners probably don't even know about this entire phenomenon 
of self-publishing. So there's like this burgeoning movement, uh, the indie author movement, right? Mm -hmm. So I still hear all the time from uh, would-be authors who say, oh, I send out these query letters to these agents or to these publishing houses, and you know, it's six months later, I still haven't heard back, so I'm probably not even going to go ahead and write this book. And they're totally missing the whole point of this whole revolution that's going on now. So I got together with about 125 of the top-selling, uh, best-selling indie authors in the world. Sandra here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, late last year, and we decided to do something together. So, you know, my background between being a, an entrepreneur and a journalist and a fiction author all came together in this idea of creating this platform. You know, everybody, everybody's got a platform now, right? Uh, you got Medium as a platform, you got YouTube, uh, Instagram, even the TikTokers, you know, the young kids <laughs> have their own platform. But authors don't have a platform, so we, we are creating a platform here. But what do you need for a platform as an author? You need readers, but you also need... Uh, some skill tech technologies to, to go to help you with your career. So we're doing both. Uh, Alessandra, why don't you tell, them, tell David a little bit about our two different brands that we're launching here? Absolutely. So Authors AI is our parent company, and then we have two kind of silos. One is Binge Books, which is a reader-based platform. So just like authors need a place, readers need a place, and it's going to be kind of their place to find great books, discuss great books with others, review and share those books. And um, so that's our so reader. So that, that is going to be a like a reader platform as far as, I, I mean, I'll compare it to like how I get books on my Kindle, for example. Yeah, yeah. A similar platform would be Goodreads, Goodreads. or okay. yeah, like 100% like for readers and a place for readers to connect with authors. So behind that business, we have our 125 best-selling authors that they have, you know, um, a, a, a access to that they can't get on other sites. So that's okay. Binge Books. And then we have Authors AI, which is our author site, and that is really focused and powered by artificial intelligence. Okay. Um, and its focus is helping authors to write better books, to improve their books, to improve their craft so that they can write books that can then be devoured and enjoyed by readers on binge books. And then AI is working really on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so there's a lot of invisible ties between the two sides. Now that that sounds really cool. Artificial intelligence just in the last year, maybe 18 months has really grown by leaps and bounds. In fact, I, I now, this isn't books, but it's another creative, which is music. I just saw a video where some guy playing with AI force-fed his AI algorithm machine every ACDC song ever made. And they had this, this, this AI machine basically uh, create a brand new from scratch ACDC song based of all their, their styles. And I listened to it. And I, I was blown away. That was uh, that was really cool. And mm -hmm. I'm assuming that is kind of how the AI would be working with with you all. How, can you explain how the AI works for the authors? I guess. Absolutely, it doesn't work in that fashion. Okay. Um, so we're not. Uh, we're, our AI is not writing books at oh. all. That's yeah. not. Um, that is not our business model. Um, and is not what we're interested in. What we are interested in is our AI, just like that um, singer or developer force yeah. fed CDC into, you know, it's AI. Um, Marlo, which is the name of our technology, Marlo has read um, hundreds of best selling books. So she okay. reads really high quality titles that um, readers were really popular with readers. Uh -huh. And um, so, and has learned from those titles what sets those books apart and why, you know, what are the commonalities and traits that are found in these best selling Random things like best selling novels contain more question marks than non best selling novels. So a lot of just like hundreds of data points like that. And then right. she can read your novel whenever you write one <laughs> she can read it and say, Hey, this is great. But if you want to move closer to kind of, you know, the gold standard, here are some things that you can change in your book. And it's really cool because when she reads a novel, she can actually plot its like emotional high and low points on a graph. And it's just really cool to see your book in a way you've never seen it before. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and find things in it that you can improve. So exactly then, like, why would an author use the artificial intelligence to help them improve it? And how, I mean, this is going to be a series of questions. So how does it kind of help them improve it? And I mean, if you're looking at all these great books that you fed into it, it, if I'm a writer, I don't know, do I want it to get these good ideas from what it's learned before? Is there a way to limit it to, to me and my writings? Like, can you get into that? That's really interesting to me. Yeah, um, you asked several questions, so I'm trying oh, yeah. to think where to start. Yeah. Uh, all great questions. Yeah. Um, why would an author want to use Marlo? Um, well, the first thing is she's super fast, um, So and, it's, and she's inexpensive. I hate to, I don't want to use the word cheap, but right. she's, uh, she's super affordable. So in a normal world, like JD was saying, a lot of people aren't aware of self-publishing, but self-publishing, which has really become, really has started to take over publishing, the publishing industry. We are, as authors, are responsible for hiring our own editors and for improving our own novels. We don't have a traditional publisher who's paying for that and supporting that. So um, we can pay thousands of dollars per book in editing. Um, and it's a time-consuming thing. Editors book six months to a year out sometimes. They then have your book for three or four weeks. AI can read your book and deliver 25 pages of feedback in, you know, 15 minutes. So, and for a fraction of, I mean, our plans start at 20, well, free. Our plans start at free. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like our Mac Daddy plan is $29.95 a month, you know, and, and you get multiple reports for that. So, um, so that's why they want to use it. Is It's fast. And also, it's like not a, a lot of times when you're a new author and you have a book, like you're afraid to give it to anybody. Like you don't, because you don't know, is it like right. horrible, wonderful? So uh, it, this is like an easy, you know, non-judgmental way that you can kind of instantly get some some sort of an idea if your book's good or not. So to me, it, it sounds like it's giving you more feedback based off of what traditionally is considered a good book. Is that is that pretty? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what she has found to be what yes, what we consider bestsellers. Bestsellers are box. a very common question. Yeah, uh, we get two questions. We get that question, and we get like, oh, well, aren't, won't all the books be exactly the same if Marlo's telling them the same feedback, right? Like, or is trying to get you know to help them reach. Um, that gold standard. So it's very, um, Marlo can point out that the first half of your book is slow, right? Like is slow and pacing and is more likely to be put down by a reader. But she's not going to tell you ideas of how to make the first half more exciting. That okay. is you. That's your creativity. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. and yeah, so everything, um, her focus is more on how quickly the reader will read the book, how interested they'll be in it, right. um, and then tips like, are you using too many adverbs or adjectives? Um, are you varying your sentence structure? Um, things like we have a naughty word, like are you using too many explicatives or cliches and things like that in your writing. So we, we definitely don't want to kill creativity. We, we are authors by nature, so we want to maintain that. David, if I could add, add to that as well. Um, as, as an author, you know, I was sort of confronting these kind of questions a couple of years ago when I was writing my first uh, thriller. It's like, how original do I really want to be here? Because, um, you know, readers have certain kind of expectations. There are certain, like, uh, what we call tropes uh, from genre to genre. It's like you have to have a certain number of uh, dead bodies in the thriller, right? Or, you know, they have to sort of live happily ever after the romance yeah. novel. You don't want to, yeah, you don't want too many dead bodies in a romance novel or vice versa, right? So, uh, what what we are what we're doing here is basically trying to understand from the the trove of you know thousands of bestsellers out there genre by genre going in there and understanding what are the kinds of things that really um, make a successful novel. But uh, basically, the question is, what do readers want? Uh, it's not like the AI is telling us you know to write a certain kind of novel. It's just telling you, here's what you know if you really want to sell a lot of books. Uh, here's a piece to success in your genre, right? right? So it's up to you to actually be the creative uh, engine behind those story ideas or the plot structure or, you know, however you want to do. But it's basically 
there are certain ways to write a novel. You know, you have to have like an inciting event at the beginning. You have to have some sort of deep uh, struggle for the protagonist. All the kinds of things right. that, you know, it really takes you like 20 books to understand how this all stuff works. Mm -hmm. But now you can just plug, uh, plunk your manuscript into an AI and it'll, it'll tell you the answers to this stuff. Yeah, now that, that sounds really really great and what's going through my head right now is I'm trying to figure out how do I repurpose Marlo for this podcast <laughs> <laughs> you can always use more viewers but, uh, <laughs> no that that's good I'm how many I mean the service is somewhat newer how right how long ago has it launched yeah we just launched six weeks ago six weeks ago that's great do you have yeah. many first-time authors on there, or are they mostly going to be those established authors, the, the ones that you've mentioned? It's hard to know. We have an interesting mix. Um, right now, we're working more on segmenting our audience so that we understand them more and know more about them. Um, but a lot of our audience is experienced authors. But when we did early beta testing, we really ran the gamut from right. um, complete newbies to people who've written 50 books. Um, our our uh, early authors are run the gamut, basically. So we have a lot of aspiring authors who are writing their first book and want to sort of understand how all this stuff works, you know, what you put into a novel, uh, from, from plot structure and pacing to subject matter and character traits, right, uh, to more established authors who want to understand why a certain book hit, hit it big while another one didn't, right? You can sort of compare manuscripts side by side. So, honestly, almost any author in the world uh, would do well to at least give this a shot to sort of uh, run a manuscript through, sort of understand what are the kinds of things they can tell you. We have a lot of people who've already given us glowing testimonials. Uh, I, I was a little nervous at the beginning. <laughs> it's like, a product out there, you don't know if you have product market fit, right? But we, we've spent enough time with authors to sort of understand what their pain points are. And so now they're, they're saying, wow, this is like really amazing, it's phenomenal, it's better than I expected. Um, so we're taking all this feedback and, and feeding it into our into our uh, roadmap of, mm -hmm. you know, what are the additional things that people want to see? So we didn't have like a cliche finder a few months ago. Somebody came okay. up with that great idea. Uh, repetitive phrases. There are all those kinds of things that kind of trip you up as an author. And so we're trying to help uh, help them along the way with AI to tell you where you're going a little bit off the map. That, no, that, that that's great. But what about for the different types and styles of books out there? For example... What if it's an autobiography versus nonfiction or a short story or even just a, a period piece? Is it able to kind of differentiate between those types of subjects? This question's really easy to answer because um, Marla doesn't read nonfiction. Okay. So, um, and it's for a specific reason. Um, nonfiction is laid out completely differently and doesn't have the same sort of plot arc that a fiction novel does. So she doesn't read nonfiction. Doesn't doesn't mean she won't at one day in the future, but right now she doesn't read nonfiction. And she does better with longer stories. She can read short stories, but um, really 20,000 words longer is the sweet point. And I think she just read her longest novel recently, which was like almost four or 500,000 words. Oh, wow. Um, Wow. So, Roughly, yeah. give me an idea. 400, 500,000 words. How many pages on an average book size are we talking? Um, we're talking one of the thickest books you've ever seen. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So a normal novel is um, uh, 60,000 to 100,000 words is a normal wow. novel. So it's four or five times a normal novel. Wow. Yeah. That is definitely huge. Yeah. By the way, if there's some of your uh, listeners who are writing like a non-fiction book. I've, I've got a couple of non-fiction friends, uh, author friends, who have actually run their manuscripts through Marlowe and they found value in it because it does other things like it'll, it'll show you misspelling. So it'll show you, you know, you use these words too often or you use the cliche. The kind of things that you might get uh, through a paid membership in Grammarly or Pro Writing Aid, there, there are all these other kind of services out there. We kind of combine all of these into one with the Pro Report, but the basic free report will actually help you along as well. That's a great point. 
Yeah. What one thing that really just stuck out to me, and I never thought about this up until Alessandra mentioned it, was about how the I guess the plot curve of nonfiction being different than that of fiction books. I've never never thought about that, and that that that's actually kind of cool once you think about it because you know fiction books are going to be you know almost like a created piece of art whereas nonfiction books you're kind of telling a, a real story of how things happened right so that curve is going to well be yeah actually you're right and actually if it's a not if it's a, a bi biography right. um, I think Marlo could Marlo would do fine with the biography and if it was a um, a nonfiction but written as a story okay then like a memoir, she'd do great with. Like that'd be yeah. fine. But um, but if you're talking about like, well, who moved my cheese is too short. But if you're talking about you know like just a business book, there's no climax, right, to build up to. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's not emotional highs and lows in that book. So that's where she'd kind of be lost. And, right. and by the way, uh, you you hit it spot on, David, with the question about the different kind of di distinctions between the different genres. So. Literally yesterday, we delivered our first batch of books to this book scanning outfit down the road from where I live, you know, uh, outside of San Jose, California. And what they do is like the, the laws around copyright are so damn weird. <laughs> you, yeah. you are not allowed to take an ebook and like just use it uh, to incorporate into your AI database because that, that would violate the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So you have to actually take the, the paperback version, bring it to an OCR company, have them wow. scan it page by page, and then uh, translate it into a Word document, and then you could add it to your corpus. So we're, we're now in a process of adding hundreds of thrillers and mystery novels and fantasy novels and science fiction. So we'll be able to actually make different recommendations to different kind of authors. Is, is there a a point where if you're feeding all this data into Marlo that it, it could just be too much data for it to come out with good results or is more data better the more the better okay. the more the better also because you're right at some point like her learning curve is going to flatten out right? right like the more she sees it, it'll be but she's not just reading great books we're also giving her um, not non bestsellers. So she's also <laughs> learning she's also learning what not you know what not to look for. But the more books she reads in specific genres, then she can really tone like hone in a historical thriller that, you know, is most successful if it's pacings like this. Because a thriller's pacing is different than a romance. And a thriller's plot right. work looks different. You know, there's a lot of and those genre-specific comparisons, those are going to be awesome when those um, once we're able to add those to her report. Yeah, no, that that's some um, really really interesting. Because I mean, I, I when I asked that question, what I was thinking is, if you look at like polling sampling, you know, things like that, where they usually say, yeah, you know, you need it at a certain size, but if you get that size sample too big, it's actually more inaccurate than the smaller ones are. So I was wondering if that's how it worked with AI or not. And that, that's a really interesting answer that, that you gave. And it, it seems like you have the ability to really tailorize it in time for different niche groups. Now, one thing that JD mentioned, too, that I also wanted to touch on was with the scanning, the OCR pages, all that stuff, and the legal challenges that you have to go through to be able to do that. I remember when Google was scanning up their books that there was a lot of issues like that. So how all did you guys have to handle that? I mean, was it as simple as scanning it with the page books, or were there more rights negotiations and stuff like that. Well, let me, let me start off, Alessandro, okay? Um, <laughs> one of our, the third co-founder, uh, the third uh, musketeer here is uh, Matt Jockers. Uh, uh, Dr. Jockers is a dean of Washington State University. He's the co-author of The Best Seller Code okay. that really caused a lot of uh, ripples in the industry a few years ago. 
Um, and so we attracted him to our startup, you know, last year. He, he actually wrote a friend of the court uh, brief in the Google case, like 10 years uh, ago. Right? Okay, so for the Google <laughs> scan, yeah. So, so we always say, oh, we want to do this. And he said, well, according to precedent of this, this case, so we're very familiar with this. We want to do a lot of things. We think, you know, there are two ways to think about this, Dave, like what you're allowed to do legally and what you don't want to do from a business point of view because it may have some repercussions to your bottom line. So we don't want to piss off, you know, the major publishers or even the Hollywood studios by putting up, like, here's Stephen King's novel, The Stand, that we scanned in. Here's a complete report on that. Uh, even though legally we know we can do it because it's fair use, there's not a single word for the entire novel in our report, but we don't want to sort of get on the wrong side of these folks, right? So we're, we're trying to partner with a lot of these publishers. So we're going to actually put that into our dashboard. We're now creating a uh, internal... To clarify, I don't know that, to clarify that, what I'm hearing is that you could live in the gray, but you're choosing not to live so much in the gray, right? You're trying to keep it more fair. black and white. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Well, we're just no, playing it I live because, you know, <laughs> there's, well, you know, uh, I think we're going to get to the point, even in a few months, we're going to have like an onboard uh, online dashboard where an author can log in. And if they're a thriller author, they'll be able to compare their narrative arc against that of a Stephen King novel, right? Nice. So, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with that, I think, legally. But it's not, you know, we don't want to just put it all in a single report and send it out to everybody who put it up on our website. Right, right. Uh, oh, go ahead, Alessandra. I was going to say, our unofficial motto is AI for good, not evil. And <laughs> we talk about gray areas, and there are a lot of gray areas once you yeah. start really working with AI. And part of, uh, I think, a lot of concern is, like, are, you know, is AI going to be writing books at some point in time? We don't want that. You know, that's not, that's not. So there, um, our goal is to always support authors and help them write great books and do it, um, you know, in the best way we can for our industry, so. Yeah. Okay. No, that, that, that's good. I mean, I have seen online that there are some, I, I, I guess we can call them sketchy companies that, yeah, you know, you want to write a book, we'll feed it into the AI engine and we'll give you a 400 page book for X amount of dollars. And that, that seems pretty sketchy to me because then it's like, wait a second, is that person really writing the book or is the machine writing the book? Who actually owns the book then? I, I think that that opens up a whole can of, of worms that I don't think we need to we need to be smart with technology, but we also you know, we need to have limitations, I think. What's really machine produced and what's actual human creativity. Yeah, yeah, just because AI can't do something, it doesn't mean you want it to do that, right? We knew the AI, AI wave was coming, and we didn't want it to watch over us as authors, right? So we're, we're coming out in front, of, in front of the wave and trying to control it a little bit and helping us with our own careers by helping us write better books instead of writing the books for us. Right, right. So I have two final questions here. We've got to get wrapping up. First one is, how do you see AI going to change the publishing industry? And I'll, I'll break that into two branches for you. Each one could take a, a branch of the question. One is AI for publishing and writing itself. And then the other one will be more like AI with a service like Marlowe and how it's going to help shape actual books. As far as AI and publishing, I mean, like, the beauty of Marlowe is you think about these publishers and agents that have been getting manuscripts for years, I mean, mountains and mountains of manuscripts that they've never even had a chance to read for the most part, and she can read an entire slush pile, you know, in a day. You know, she can read a thousand books and then let them know which ones they should have a human look at, you know, which, which are ranked in the top. So that's, that's powerful. It could be used so that um, sites like Binge Books can figure out which books should be recommended to readers. If in, in the world of publishing, you have a million books published, self-published a year. I don't know the exact number, but it's a ton of books. And that's hard for retailers to know and to distinguish what they should promote and what they shouldn't. So if AI can help with that, it can help readers find great books. 
that's great for us as reader as as authors, but it also challenges us to write the best books we can. Okay. What about you, JD? I'd love to hear your opinion on that as well, too. Yeah, and we also, by the way, one of our executives is uh, Robert McDonald. He's the former head of uh, Apple Books, uh, who is now working with the publishing industry uh, because we've got a lot of interest from the publishing industry itself on, on Marlowe, right? So they, they want to use Marlowe for their uh, authors to give their editors to help them with their refining process of the manuscripts, right? So, we, you know, this is going to go mainstream. It's not just a niche thing for the indie author market, but for, for publishers that are trying to identify the next great book that's coming out or to help uh, a manuscript that's, like, almost ready to go out to the public that they're, spend, they're dumping a quarter million dollars in a marketing budget. They want to make sure it's actually ready, right? Uh, so it's, it's like a smart investment for them as well. Right, right. So I, I just thought of another question I thought would be kind of interesting here. And this is just on the general book market as well, too, okay? As we get more technical, digital, you, you go back to like the 80s, 90s, 70s, back through there, you didn't have the internet with a billion websites out there that you can read free content, even from major publications like Forbes and all that stuff for no cost at your fingertips or read things on Facebook or Twitter or wherever it may be. Has that impacted the book industry? Like, is, is it making people read less books at all? I don't think it's caused anyone to read less. Um, what it has caused is it's ca caused a major disruption in the industry. Uh, I think libraries are getting a lot less traffic than they used to right. because where it used to be someone on a budget would go to the library and rent 10 books. Actually, they can still do that. They could just now renting ebooks and they can do it from inside their house without ever going to the library. But for, for the fiction marketplace in general, 99 cent ebooks and free ebooks have really caused a major saturation in the pricing and in the, in the industry in general. And there's kind of really two sides of it. Like, you know, um, you've got authors that are bargain, um, bargain pricing their ebooks, and then you have the authors that are really trying to maintain a certain level. But it's a constant battle. And in some genres, like romance, mm -hmm. publishers have almost completely pulled out of that market wow. because they can't compete against the self-publishers. The self-published authors are publishing faster and they're publishing cheaper and they just can't keep up with it and they can't compete with it. And and romance is very tropey. So, right. uh, you know, if uh, vampire motorcycle gangs is what's hot this month, self-published authors can write three vampire motorcycle gang books and get them out within six to eight weeks. You know, traditional publishing, they're, they're a year and a half out before they're going to have anything on the shelves, ebook shelves and print shelves. So they can't keep up with that. They can't keep up with those trends. That's let how add, I can't change. Let me add 30 seconds here, uh, David. No, that's so, fine. That's okay. fine. I, I thought of another good question after this. I'm sorry. Okay. This is so yeah. interesting. I <laughs> think people are going to love it. Okay. <laughs> no, but in addition, well, you're right, though. There has been a sort of change in habits uh, of the consumer in some ways. Uh, and it started with the, the Kindle phenomenon, which is right. only like 12 years old, right? It's really disrupted the entire book publishing world. But it's also changed reading habits. A lot, a lot of people don't read paperbacks anymore. They, they read e-readers, right? A lot, of, uh, publish, a lot of authors on our team are actually publishing to Kindle Unlimited. So you can uh, read as many books as you want in a month, you know, for 10 bucks. But there's also a subset of readers who don't really read anymore, but they listen to audiobooks. That was actually so my many, next question. So years, oh, really? Yes. Has been, uh, like, the e-book revolution is about at the end of its, its, its uh, duration here. And now the next 10 years, it's going to be more about, about um, audiobooks and other kind of formats that are just coming down the road. But I've had so many people tell me, uh, you know, I'd love to read your thriller. Just tell me when it's audio so I can read it when I'm jogging or going to work or something else, right? Um, and science fiction authors in particular, I don't know if you know this, uh, they're making a ton of money off their audio. It's like 10 times more than they make with their print books or their e-books. Right. There's just something about science fiction and some other genres that are, really lend themselves to being uh, listened to in an audiobook format.
Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I was uh, looking because one of the science fiction authors is a good friend of mine. I believe you're friends with him as well, uh, Douglas E. Richards. And, oh, he's down, uh, in, yep. down in San Diego. And here's an interesting fact. Yeah. If, if, uh, I don't know if you put his books into Marlowe or not, but if you did, do a search. You'll find David Strausser, President David Strausser, in his book. <laughs> You're famous. I am President David Strausser in one of his books, and I, I Are you actually President of the United States or like of a country? President of the United States. Wow! Wow! Yes, yes. I believe it's like two chapters of the book in a flashback. It was really, really, really kind of um, him. But that goes to the other point. Even that book, the book that I'm in. I own about 15 copies of it, then I autograph it and give it away for Christmas gifts, obviously. But I only ever listen to it in Audible on the digital digital format. How does Marlowe account for a book that may only... It, it's a book, technically, but maybe it's only going to be an Audible release of the book. Like Kevin Hart, he just did that with... A book that he wrote did not get a paper or e-digital release. It's just an audible release. Does that work? Is that something that's down the road? How does? I think it's still storytelling. I think right. stories that are devoured um, by uh, audibly versus being read. I think it's the same. Um, and we see that by when we look at the bestsellers of one, it's the other. Though a lot of people I know, an audio, a great audiobook can make can make a book and a horrible audio book can kill a book so but but there's also the point uh david that even if you're not going to put out an ebook you're probably going to want to have a, a transcript of your audio right. book right just like uh podcasters are now doing uh transcripts of their podcasts so it can get get fed into google right and get found yep. by more people so i don't know if you do that for Short bite. I am now. <laughs> I will be good good that. So, I guess to finish up right here, how can people contact you either individually, your website, uh, well, both companies you have, both branches? Uh, can you give us that info? Absolutely. So, if you visit authors.ai, authors plural.ai, that's our site. Both of our profilers. Profiles are there under the Our Team tab, but um, you can run an AI report on your manuscript for free, um, or we have our advanced plans available. And we do have a coupon code for your followers, so SharkBite will save you 20% on a single report. One yeah. word or two words? One word. One word, SharkBite. Yeah. There you go, everybody. I'll make sure on YouTube, the link will be in the description with the coupon code. Everybody all listening. Yep. All lowercase as well, too, for best, the audio list. Best off that manuscript from your bottom drawer and put it through Marlon. Who knows? It's you might have a bestseller on your hands. <laughs> hey, my, uh, my manuscript's about two pages long so far. It's um, been working on it for about 10 years. So. <laughs> but any final words you all want to have? Any words of wisdom to aspiring writers out there? Don't give up. So we have a lot more uh, aspiring authors with half-completed books who get another great idea and toss it aside, but you just got to keep going. And first drafts are supposed to be painful. They're supposed to be awkward. They're supposed to be gross. Uh, you just got to plow through at the end and then send it over to Marlo, and she can help you clean it up. And if you're, an, if you're a reader, a book reader, come on over to Binge Books. We're, we're going to be launching later this summer. And it's going to be uh, pretty phenomenal. It is. That, that's great. By the way, JD, I love the writer shirt. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. For the audio <laughs> listeners, yeah. he, he has a gray shirt with like typewriter print that just says writer. And it's the best statement shirt I've seen. That's all you need. <laughs> that's, hey, so I want to thank both of you, Alessandra and JD, for coming on here, talking about your author AI. It's a great American innovation, a great product, and I really think our listeners at some degree or level can use one of your two platforms. So thank you both so much for being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. All right.
Here's to Philadelphia. Take care. Thanks, thanks. Go Eagles, right? <laughs> I'll see you. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? Always great to hear how creative entrepreneurs have come up with a solution to fulfill a need. Further, it is pretty awesome to hear how far along AI has really come. Think about it. You can feed Marlo a report and find out, does my romance novel have too many debts? Is it too slow? You know, and that's really the best part about author's AI. You're still writing the book. You're just getting it critiqued against what typically makes a book successful. I think that's an important distinction to make and really just hit on home. Many people think, oh, I don't want to use AI while writing because then it's not really me writing the book. And if the AI was actually writing the book, yeah, maybe you have a case. But from talking with Alessandra and JD, you can hear that absolutely is not the case. Instead, you're using innovation and technology to critique your book in terms of some of the most successful books out there in the market. That's really the great thing when it comes to an AI platform like Marlowe is that we're really only scratching the surface. In time, with more exposure, a platform like Marlowe should be able to grow and get better as time goes on. Kind of like a fine wine. The more it learns, the better it critiques, the better your books that you're writing. And if you're a consumer, it's going to mean that you're reading higher quality, better books. So let me ask you, would you use a platform like Authors AI to critique your book? How do you feel about it? Leave a comment down below and please make sure you, if you're thinking about writing a book, sign up with the Authors AI code that's down in the description of this video or if you're listening through one of the many different podcast sources that we're located on, make sure that you sign up. The link and the code will both be in the description. Lastly, as always, we're growing so fast in this channel. We have gotten so much positive feedback from YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Deezer, everywhere you could think of. The platform is growing. So please, if you like the content that you're getting from Shark Bite Biz, please make sure that you subscribe. I'll see you next time. This is David Strasser with Shark Bite Biz. Take care. Thank you for listening to Shark Bite Biz. We hope you got some insightful info from this podcast. Be sure to subscribe to us through your favorite podcast app and visit us on the web at www.sharkbitebiz.com. How has business changed for you in the 20s? Email us at podcast at sharkbitebiz.com so you can join us and share your story.